Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. The Consider This team is on the road ahead of the state elections. We're in Penang today and um, we're here to get a sense of the issues that are resonating on the ground. My guest today is Dr. Lim Ma Hui, who is a member of Penang Forum and former Penang Island City Councillor. Prior to that, he was with the Asian Development Bank. Um, Dr. Lim, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's good to be able to chat to you in person. We've had you on the show a couple of times, but it's always been um, yeah, online. online. So it's lovely to have this in-person conversation you. with you. I want to begin our conversation, there's a lot to cover, but I want to begin with the Penang South Island Reclamation Project, the contentious PSI project. Um, and the fact that we now know it's been scaled down to scaled down 49%, so from three islands, just one big island. I'm wondering whether that move by the Penang <coughs> State Government to scale down this contentious project has actually allayed some of the concerns and the opposition that was coming from um, from civil society about the project. Okay. Now, the Penang South Island used to be called the Penang South Reclamation. And through the concerns of civil society, uh, they have, as you said, tried to scale it down. But we think you know, scaling down doesn't address the problem. The main pro issue is what is the rationale for the PSI? When it was floated in about 2012 or 13, around that time, almost 10 years ago, the Penang State Government that said that in order to carry out the Penang Transport Master Plan, which was increased from 27 billion ringgit to 46 billion ringgit, they needed a funding model. Mm. And Gamuda plus two other companies suggested that they use reclamation of the island as the way to fund the, this, this uh, 46 billion transport plan. Right. But uh, Later on, you know, through many of my writings and other people, we have showed that actually, A, we don't need to spend $46 billion to address the mobility and transport issue. You know, um, probably maybe $10 billion or even less possible. That uh, we don't need a lot of those expensive toys like the MRT and then the highway and all the stuff. Because we know that just building one line of MRT mm. to the airport is not going to solve the problem. So they then basically uh, went back you know, and then tried to see, okay, maybe we will try to uh, do some changes. And now they're basically talking about the LRT and then I think still maybe one highway. Okay, so, so the transport master plan still has a vision for what transport looks like in Malaysia, uh, in, in Penang. Penang. How, th there's been claims that the PSI, the, the official narrative for the PSI, has quietly shifted. It is. From being a um, reclamation exercise to, to fund. fund, to raise funds for the uh, transport plan, master plan, has now turned into what could be called a land bank exercise. That's exactly the thing. They have started to change the narrative, right? Because we have pointed out that, you know, that, uh, for example, they want to claim Island 1A. And the new model, I true, did the calculation using their, their statistics and the data that uh, because the state will now have 30% of the uh, joint venture, and 70% is owned by Gamuda. And if they reclaim most, most, most of the island A, it will only probably give less than a billion ringgit to the state government. And no way you can build even one quarter of an LRT mm. using one billion. So th th there's no more link. The original link was 
justification is no more there. And you say, as you rightly said, now they're saying that, oh, we need the land bank. Mm. Okay? But we have already stated too, Penang is not just Penang Island. Right. Penang is Penang Island plus the mainland. And the mainland is two, three times, or even, no, probably uh, five times larger There's than the so island. There's so much land there. <laughs> yes, it's true that the state government doesn't own the land. Mm. But the state government can acquire and give incentives or whatever way to make land available in the mainland, mm. right? So I don't see why, you know, we still want to push for this island. The main reason, I think, is because it is a developer's dream to have islands because then you can have expensive condominiums and, you know, places to basically sell and make you know, a lot of money. Whereas, uh, you know, if you go and do it in the mainland, it's less okay, lucrative. Your experience having been a former uh, city councillor city councilor for Penang Island, having been so active in, in civil society all these years, what is your observation, what are your observations of how the Penang state government approaches development of Penang Island and mainland as a whole. It feels to me that it is so intrinsically tied to real estate. Yeah, but what have been your observations? I think that's what you, what you observe is definitely right. That the uh, idea of development is mortar and bricks. And particularly nowhere more can you see than it's in Penang. You know, 10 years ago you come, you wouldn't have seen so many, many, many high rises. Mm -hmm. Right? And today, just Sanjong Tokong, where I live, outside there, I mean, the amount of high rise there is almost like uh, Singapore and Hong it's Kong. So, such high density. Yeah, yeah, it's high density. But the most tragic part is that only about 20% is occupied. Right. And you can see that. You go travel in the night, and you can see most of the lights are off. Okay? There's a glut of this type of expensive high-rise and apartments which are out of reach of the ordinary people. Okay? And that's where you know, we, we feel that you know, the development that is taking place is misdevelopment. It's not actual you know, good development but maldevelopment. And Penang should be more focused on you know, developing the good industry and pay, putting more, more effort into building uh, actually good human resources, you know, which they have done to some extent. For example, the PSDC, Penang Skill Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good uh, uh, institution. But then they should have like spent 10 times the money to have PD, PSDC, right? And to have much better relationship between the research centers in Penang, the universities, mm. and the industry. So I think that it's better for us to focus on such things than to build more and more uh, high-rise. Or in this case, they said we don't have land, so we have to reclaim the island. But you reclaim this island, and then it's quite costly. The land you sell probably be two, three hundred ringgit per square foot. Whereas you know you go to Kulim. You go to uh, Sabrang and all that, they can get it for 50 or less than $100. Mm. And I think that uh, there's no reason why, you know, uh, particularly in Batukawan area, right, that they are doing some major development there. Yeah. But I think they can be better planned uh, and have the high-tech area there. And plus, then you will correct the imbalance of this development between the island and in the mainland. When you started off, you know, we said, where's Penang? Penang is island, Penang is the mainland, it's both. And there's too much development or building in the main, I mean, sorry, in the well, island. Why, why is that? Why is it so island-centric? Or the policy making is centred in the island? Or the development feels centred in the island? Business as well sometimes feels like this is the, the, the nexus of where um, business is being conducted for the state of Penang. Why is that? Is it... Uh, and are there ways to make sure that development is more equitable okay. and spread out? 
Yeah, as to why, I would think because Penang as an island is natural beauty. You've got the sea, you've got the hills, right? And you have the heritage. And uh, historically, this is where there's a lot of development taking place. And you've got very good schools, or used to have very, very good schools. You know, some of the best in Malaysia putting up. I mean, your team, all of them, you said, came from Penang. That's right. right? <laughs> uh, so I think for historical reasons and for good reasons, it has been centred around Penang. Mm. But I think it's time, particularly for the Pakatan Harapan government, to uh, shift the focus to the mainland. And, you know, the Batu Kawan area is like a green field. And you can really plan a very, very good, you know, integrated, sustainable, green city in that area. Right. Plus, it is linked directly by the second bridge, which is so underused. It is. Right? We, we took it today and it was barely any cars. Exactly. And it takes no more than 15 minutes. So, you see, I think that's an ideal place to set up a really beautiful, uh, friendly, you know, a model city mm. to, to, to and have people living there rather than commuting from here and there. Right. So, so that's a very doable thing. Now, of course, the state government say they had that up to 10 years ago, like 4,000 acres of land. Correct. But today we are told there are practically no more land left. Yes, they don't own any of the land. That's there. what they say. But it is not transparent. Then we would like to know what happened to that 4,000 acres? If you say that, oh, we need it for the industry, blah, blah, blah. So the industry is not going to have 4,000 acres. Even the island that they're going to build, they're talking about only maybe a couple of hundred, I, I don't know exactly, mm. you know, a couple of hundred acres that is meant for the industry. The rest is for what? Okay, so uh, be before we get into the issue of... Uh, transparency uh, from state government. I want to ask you this neglect for Sabrang Parai, for the, for the mainland right. of Penang. Will this cost the Pakatan Harapan, the DAP government, political capital in the next state elections? Are the people of Sabrang Parai sick of being invisible and neglected and underdeveloped the same way Penang Island has been developed? I don't have a crystal ball, but I would think it would have some impact, right? Particularly, you see the last federal election mm. that uh, states which, uh, no, seats that we thought was pretty safe, including that for Nurul Iza, mm. fell to the opposition. Now, there are two ways of looking. Some people talk about the green wave. But some people say that's not a green wave. That basically it is uh, people unhappy with economic factors that they are left behind. And then, of course, politicians in Malaysia particularly like to use race and religion to go and kachau kachau mm. and get their votes. Mm. So I think it's a combination of both, right? So definitely, I think if the state government were more genuine in paying attention to this bread and butter issues and development, that would go a long way to, to get the support. Mm. But this election is so near. Right. So I can't say what will happen. But for example, the other one, which is not only national, but at the state level, is what type of jobs do you want to create? Right. So on the one hand, you need the high paying and high caliber job like we definitely need a lot of engineers, okay? And if we can't produce enough or good ones, then we should import foreigners and all that, okay? That's at one level. The other level is then we need the rank and file, really good technicians to, to man the factories, mm. to run it, okay? And I think Malaysia and Penang can lead the way in saying just enough do not produce any more graduates because we have hundreds of thousands of graduates okay. who are not, who are unemployed. But in my opinion, many of them are unemployable in the sense that they don't have the pro correct skills. You know, they can't communicate, they, they can't think properly, laterally and all that. 
So one thing is to be unemployed, the other thing is unemployable. So it is high time that we spend more money to have vocational training and a proper one. You know? And to do it together with the industry as well as with the universities. Mm. Like for example, you can just imagine if we spend you know, hundreds of millions of ringgit or billions instead of the island and all the stuff on training. And it wouldn't be that long to train good technicians. Probably five years, right? You give them skills and then get them to work in the industry and work together. That, you know, would create a lot of problems. Are you I mean, sorry, a lot of a, a solutions, solutions to the, the problems. Um, are you seeing this kind of um, diagnosis of the problem? So, so from the state government, are they are they looking at where there are gaps in the economy, where how to create high income jobs, where you know where where to put the investment into the the people? Are, are there any is there any indicator um, an indication that that is the thinking of state government in the decision-making process for the future of the Penang development? Well, they have, they invest a lot and spend a lot on the Penang Institute. Penang Institute is supposed to be the think tank mm. for the Penang state government, right? And their budget is around three to four million ringgit. And actually, they do put up sometimes good suggestions. When I was on the board, you know, of Penang Institute, uh, for about 10 years, right? They had, you know, we had young staff members who had put out some very good reports, for example, on housing. Mm. Still very relevant. Yes. Okay. But do you know something, Melissa? That report was just simply put in the shelf. Okay, so they, collecting dust. Correct. You know, they have no interest. There's one thing, you have the, 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 the people do the research. The other thing is, Lim Guan Eng and Ospir don't want to look, look well, at it. Well, sometimes that's a that's, uh, problem I've seen not limited to just Penang. Penang. I think that happens in many other states and many other countries as well where you have great recommendations from, yes. from thinkers, from academics, from civil society, but it's not exactly. been implemented. Um, so here, here's the question. When it comes to what Penang should be focused on, what does, what in your uh, opinion are some of the most pressing matters that Penang must focus on? Definitely, I think when it has to have quote unquote development. Mm. But the question I always tell people, because when I was in the council, when I speak out against certain things, then say, Dr. Lim, how come you're against development? I say, Cook, I can't be against development. Development. It's a word like motherhood. Can anybody <laughs> be against motherhood? Correct? You can't. So the, the question you have to ask me is what kind of development? Or to put it in a grammatical way, I'm more interested in the adjective than the noun. Mm. Right? Development, everybody is for development. Yeah. Is kind? it bad development? Is it good development? Is it sustainable? Is it destructive? Is it balanced? Is it equitable? Mm. That's where you have to focus. So, I see that A, we must have balanced development. And balance not only in geography, but also in social economic terms. That means basically strata or class, mm. right? And that's why I come back to, okay, I think it's important to train engineers, but it's just as important, if not more important, to train the vocational class people. Because that's where there's a lot of dissatisfaction and where you get then people who are bored, they go into mud ramp pit. Instead of, do, instead of being a mud ramp pit, why don't be a mud mechanic? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and people who are mechanic, they can get jobs easily. They have to work with their hands. So we have to do that. That's important. That's on the economic side. Right. Then on the environmental side, I think we have to pay attention to, to nature. And mm. we shouldn't be raping our hills and, 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 and what you call, uh, you know, reclaiming our sea and, and, and uh, threatening our uh, livelihood of not only fishermen, but actually of all Penang, because we still can have fresh fish. Mm. You know, my wife and I goes 
go, go, go to Tanjung Bunga and we buy fresh fish from the fishermen who bring it up. Right. I think in KL you can't do that. Not at all. You can't. Never right? be as fresh as from the sea. Exactly. <laughs> So, why are we doing it? Why do we want to destroy, you know, this rich seabed for the, the benefit of a few people? Mm -hmm. it, it's wrong. Okay, so when you talk to fellow Penangites, do these issues resonate with them? Or are these the issues that concern a certain class of Penangites? I'm wondering because is there a desire to participate in the democracy of Penang beyond elections? Well, first of all, I think in, my, in our experience, we have had many public forums, mm. right? When people come, for example, they all are very agitated about the traffic problem, right? And they want a solution. But the government comes and says, oh, LRT. But LRT doesn't solve the problem. We know that in, 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 in uh, KL. KL. It does not. Right? <laughs> you have spent hundreds of billions on LRT and MRT, and your public modal share is what? 15%. 15%. Our public modal share is 5%. Mm. Right? So they want to have a solution, but the government comes have LRT, which is driven by the private sector. Right. Okay. okay? Because they want to make money. And the people, oh yeah, LRT is good. But when they come to our forum and we explain to them, look, what are the costs and benefits and what are the alternatives, blah, 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 and all that. They say, oh my, Dr. Lim, what are you saying is correct? They go back, they change their view. So my point is that, yes, people are interested. They want to. Okay? But there's no avenue and, and, and uh, there's no participation. And this government, the last thing they want is to have active citizens' participation because that's an impediment for them and, and, and for those. As I said earlier, Melissa, we don't have democracy. We think democracy means one person, one vote. Correct? Everybody goes and vote once in five years. Sure, we do that. But once the politicians are voted, they don't listen to us. They listen to those people who fund them who continue to give them money. So we have one dollar, one vote. We don't have one person, one vote. And this is the problem. What explains re-election then? If it's re one, yeah, so what ex explains a government that may not be listening to the voices of the people being re-elected over and over again by the same people? <laughs> <laughs> well, because, uh, because they have very little other chances because the, 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 most of the politicians think the same way. So they don't have much choices. And when you want to have the third alternative come in, it, the structure is such that it is very difficult mm. because of political funding and all the stuff, right? Like, for example, in the United States, they do. You either vote for the elephant or you vote for the other one, they, and, and they are about the same. Right. So that is a basic issue. So to say that I would you know, push for, at the local level, participation of the citizens in decision-making process. And the Local Government Act does uh, have what you call clauses and all that, which uh, facilitates this. But the local government and the state government doesn't want to implement it. Okay, give me an example of how you'd like to see more uh, participation in local decision making. Local decision making. Okay, I'll give you two examples. One is decisions are made at meetings and they're all closed doors. Okay? But actually, as I said, Local Government Act says that you know, it can be open and people should participate in it. So they don't allow. Even at the, uh, uh, not at the committee level, but at the what you call uh, monthly uh, local council when they pass those laws, uh, public are allowed to go and observe, but they can't speak. So that's a big problem. Mm. Why, why can't it be debated? That's one. The second one, which is very uh, relevant and topical, is the local plan. Penang state government is the one, only one in Malaysia, that still doesn't have a gazetted local plan. Mm -hmm. right? And the local plan, which they then uh, 
pushed out about six months ago, you know, had a lot of problems. And civil servant, I mean civil society looked through it and, and, and complained about it. And one of the things that was very clear that they did not engage enough uh, local people's uh, participation in the formulation right. of the plan. Okay. Not, not in, you know, you don't get ask people after you formulated and then uh, it's just a bureaucratic exercise. Oh yes, tick the box, uh, they have spoken, they have did this, and, and that's not. So we, when we found out there were so many, many problems with it, and we forced them to have a town meeting at the last minute. You know what? Just last week, uh, Chao Kong Yao, our chief minister, says, sorry, the plan, we agree that is full of mistakes. And who were the ones who pointed out the mistakes? The civil society. We spent hundreds of hours pouring through these volumes of stuff to bring this to their attention. They paid millions of ringgit to the consultants to do this job and did such a bad job that they had to withdraw it and go back to the drawing board. Wow. Okay. Well, Dr. Lim, I'm going to have to end there because our time is up, but I want to thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Appreciate your thank time. Thank you very much. And you sharing your home with us to shoot this episode. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure and I hope I made a small contribution. Thank you. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.